Hi, I'm Jessica, the Museum Guide, and today we have something a little bit different. See, obviously we talk about museums on this channel, but there are other places to keep and store collections, like pubs. So today, we're going to be exploring six London pubs and having a look at the very strange things that they keep on display. So I'm really excited about this video because it combines two things that I really love, great old London pubs and weird artifacts. Now we're used to seeing dusty old cases filled with oddities in museums, yes, but London's pubs also offer a wealth of unique and interesting objects that you can marvel at and enjoy alongside a drink. Today, we're going to explore six of London's pubs, learn about their history, and see the bizarre and macabre artifacts that they have on display. These are great places to have a drink and lean into the dark history of the city. Now, some might say that the strangest things in a London pub are its patrons, and I won't argue, and you'll often find me amongst the punters. But today, we're focusing on mummified cats, famous taxidermy, ominous nooses, old jail cells, stopped clocks, and bizarre baked goods. So are you intrigued? I am. Good. <laughs> Remember, I offer walking tours and pub tours that visit these wonderful watering holes, along with other strange churches nearby, and of course, museums. So get in touch, my contact details are below. Let's start with our first pub, the Old Cheshire Cheese and Polly the Parrot. But before we head inside to the pub, have a look here down at the stoop. You can see 350 years of wear beneath this metal grate from people stumbling in and out of this door. Now, you'll notice that I said the Old Cheshire Cheese and not Ye Oldy. That's because this letter isn't a Y. It's a thorn. This is a character used in Middle English that was eradicated after the invention of the printing press to streamline the printing process. And the first printing press in London was just a few steps away from this pub. The Victorians added the thorn to this side because the Victorians loved old timey things. They loved making things seem older than they actually were. Now, if you're wondering the phonetic sound that a thorn makes, you already know. It sounds like th. So this says the old Cheshire cheese. But let's get back to the pub. It was originally founded in the 1530s, but is now famous for being the first pub rebuilt after the Great Fire of London in 1666. You can see that the pub was rebuilt in 1667. I mean, we had our priorities straight. Get the pub back up and running. The vaulted cellars are thought to belong to a 13th century Carmelite monastery that once occupied the site. And of course, you could have a drink down here. This is my favorite place to bring guests. This was the favorite pub of artists such as Joshua Reynolds and literary greats such as Dickens, Twain, Conan Doyle, and G.K. Chesterton, owing to its location just steps from Fleet Street, the former newspaper district. And of course, the pub is associated with Samuel Johnson, who compiled the first English language dictionary and lived just a few steps away from here. Though we have no actual proof he patronized this pub, he lived so close and there are pictures of him all over the place, not to mention a first edition dictionary displayed upstairs. But it's not the dictionary that we're here to see, although if you get a chance, go and have a look. No, we're here to see Polly the African Grey Parrot, taxidermized and now residing behind the ground floor bar. Yes, he is probably the most famous parrot in English history. He was the resident rude boy here at the Cheshire Cheese until 1926. He would be rude to visitors that he didn't like and would lash out at them with a list of his favorite insults, behavior which, understandably, made him a bit of a local celebrity. People wanted to come here and get cussed out and read to filth by this parrot. <laughs> Now, I know we think of a dark and moody pub like this one serving ales, but back then, bankers and successful newsmen drank copious amounts of champagne, men after my own heart. Famously, Polly learned how to imitate the sound of champagne corks, something that became even more common after the armistice was signed ending the First World War in 1918. Polly died in 1926, allegedly of exhaustion after he imitated the sound of popping corks over 400 times, but it was more likely pneumonia. 
Upon his death, around 200 newspapers around the world wrote obituaries while the news was read out on the radio. According to the Exeter and Plymouth Gazette, the news, quote, gloomed half London. Before we leave the cheese, I want to mention a few other strange objects that were discovered here, though they now reside in the collection of the Museum of London. I'm talking about a series of erotic tiles made from plaster of Paris that were discovered after a fire in 1962. The tiles date to the mid-18th century and suggest that the upper rooms of this atmospheric pub were once a brothel. They were displayed at the Museum of London only once, on Valentine's Day 2014, at an exhibition entitled Late London, City of Seduction. They're no longer on display. I mean, nothing is. The Museum of London is closed for five years to relocate and renovate, but there seem to be no plans to exhibit them any time in the future naughty. This is by far the most famous pub on our tour and it is well worth your visit when you're in London. Now let's head just down the street from the Cheshire Cheese toward the Viaduct Tavern and in my opinion this is one of the prettiest pubs in all of London built in 1865 and named for the nearby Hoburn Viaduct. This is a former gin palace, so named at a time when it was considered quite unacceptable for women to patronize pubs. Pubs, of course, looked and felt more like the Cheshire cheese, dark, smoky, and more than a little grimy. In contrast, gin palaces were bright, beautiful, and bedecked with glass, gilt, and mirrors. They served gin, a spirit with both sophisticated and trashy associations since the 18th century. To learn more about how gin wreaked havoc on London, watch my video on the Hunterian Museum, which I've linked just above. While the most destitute in society drank themselves to death with cheap, overproof gin, it was also associated with French and Belgian fashion and the wealthy jet-set class. An establishment like this one was obviously trying to evoke the latter. Therefore, it's an interesting juxtaposition that it's home to such a grim oddity. The old debtor cells beneath the pub, once associated with the old Bailey courthouse directly across the street. The Old Bailey is the traditional nickname for London's Central Criminal Court. For more info on its infamous death bell and the public executions held there, watch my video about the most macabre things in London's churches. A prison was first recorded on this site in 1188, and the Old Bailey Courthouse was eventually attached to the prison. The entire complex was knocked down in 1904 and replaced by the current Old Bailey Courthouse, which you can see here. The Viaduct Tavern was here in the Victorian days when the prisoners staying across the street included Oscar Wilde and two female serial killers. The pub was also in operation when the last public hanging took place outside Newgate Prison in 1868. And yes, that means that you could take the London Underground to watch a public hanging for five years they overlapped. But while the current iteration of the Old Bailey Courthouse came later, some people say the old debtor cells remained here underneath the Viaduct Tavern, either from deep in the foundations of the medieval Newgate Prison, or perhaps from the old Giltspur Street Compter, a debtor's prison in use between 1700 and 1853. Now, just to reiterate, the cells that I'm poking around right now, and this was ultra, ultra creepy, especially when the barman left me alone. But just to reiterate, these were never criminal cells. And some people argue that they were never cells at all. But what is a debtor's prison? They were prisons for people who were unable to pay debt and were a common way to deal with and punish unpaid debt. Now just imagine being imprisoned down here in the cold and dark. I can tell you it's extremely damp and unpleasant. That said, it's been investigated pretty thoroughly, and the lack of graffiti and the general wear patterns indicate that it was never actually a jail cell. It's a great story, though, and the lovely staff are always nice enough to let me pop downstairs with a tour group or even on my own, as I am right now. (laughs) And did I mention that many people believe that the Viaduct Tavern is haunted? And to be honest, down here in this incredibly creepy subterranean jail cell, it's very easy to see why the rumors of hauntings persist. But seriously, just look at how beautiful this pub is. This is one of my favorite places in the area to come for a drink, even if I'm just grabbing a quick cup of tea. It's a lovely place. Let's head to our third pub. 
It's a dirty dicks near Liverpool Street Station, home to an infamous cabinet of curiosities. Now, I've been guiding in this area for a decade now, and I've witnessed many people, students and adults alike, giggling at this sign. Now, grow up, everybody. (laughs) But no, it actually references a specific man and his very strange story. See, Dirty Dick was a silly nickname for Nathaniel Bentley, and he was a hoarder, but he didn't start that way. Bentley started as a merchant in the late 18th and early 19th century, running a hardware shop and warehouse near Leadenhall Market. Tragically, his fiancée died on the eve of their wedding, and he is said to have closed the reception room, already set for the wedding breakfast, and never opened the doors again. Some even think he was the inspiration for Miss Havisham in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, because he also began to refuse to throw anything away or wash himself. Dickens does seem to be referencing Dirty Dick in a poem published in his magazine, Household Words. He writes, Yet give we a thought, free of scoffing or ban, to that dirty old house and that dirty old man. Bentley's warehouse and house became so filthy and decrepit that he became a local legend. Any letter addressed simply to quote the dirty warehouse, London, would be accurately delivered to him until his death in 1809. When he died, his cousins inherited a pub that he owned called the Old Jerusalem. Being savvy business people, and a bit twisted, they decided to cash in on his infamy, and they changed the name to Dirty Dicks, and decorated the joint with the strangest ephemera from Bentley's warehouses and shop. Now, that included cobwebs and mummified dead cats, which, by the way, were historically thought to be good luck. Here's one on display in the floor of the Museum of London. There's also a mummified cat here at the wonderfully bizarre Victor Wind Museum, which I named the strangest museum in London in the video linked above. There's yet another mummified cat on display at the Sir John Soane Museum. He found this one when renovating his townhouses in the 18th century. Let me know if you'd like to see a video about the Soane Museum, and maybe I should make a video just on mummified cats. There's a lot I'm not even covering here. But back to Dirty Dick's family. And they brought these things from his original warehouse and they dotted them throughout the bar. But in the 80s, the pub had to undergo a deep cleaning to keep its license and the grisly bits were consolidated and tidied into this glass display case. Now that's where I used to bring people to come and look at them and admire them myself when on the way to the loo. But sadly, in the past few years, the health and safety inspectors have insisted that even the glass case was not sanitary enough. And there are a few spooky and bizarre bits left in this case. It's still worth having a look, but the mummified cats are now gone. And I was gutted to find that out when I came to film this. Now that said, the pub is still well worth a visit to see what's on display, and you can check out a lot of clippings and drawings of old Nathaniel Bentley, aka Dirty Dick, as you have a nice pint or two or more. I won't judge you. Before we leave the topic of mummified cats, we need to talk about another pub. Now, I mentioned that there are a few dried cats in London's museums, and I talk about a very different cat mummy in my video on the strangest things in the British Museum. But there are also some famous mummified cats associated with churches and pubs, specifically this one in North London. Now, this really shouldn't come as much of a surprise, because the dried bodies of cats are often found concealed within the walls of old buildings, believed to bring good luck to the structure and its occupants, or potentially to scare off vermin or ward off evil spirits. Elaborately staged tableaus have been found, with rats dangling from the jaws of dried old cats. Which brings us to this pub, which is sadly permanently closed. Whittington and Cat in Archway is a protected pub that is named for the storied 15th century Lord Mayor of London, Dick Whittington, oft remembered in children's stories and pantos. Whittington is famous for packing up and leaving London with his cat, only to be called back to the city from Highgate Hill by the sound of the Bow Bells. When post-war excavations were carried out at St. Michael Paternoster Royal, long believed to be the final resting place of Whittington, a mummified cat with a dead mouse hanging from its mouth was found built into a sealed passage under the roof. Rumours abounded that this was Whittington's legendary cat, but it was more likely placed here by one of Sir Christopher Wren's masons when the church was rebuilt in 1687 after the Great Fire. 
For many years, that cat was kept in a glass display case in the church, the perfect candidate for inclusion on my list of macabre objects in churches, but it was eventually lost or stolen. Which brings us back to this pub, which claims to have its own mummified Whittington cat on display inside since 1931, it too with a mouse dangling from its lips. Sadly, despite being made an asset of community value by Islington Council in 2012, the pub has since been redeveloped, and there's no word on what happened to its mummified Moggy. At 10.40 p.m. on 8th of September 1915, Smithfield and the surrounding areas near Hoburn were under attack. The German army airship L-13, and yes, that was a Zeppelin, rained high explosive incendiary firebombs down from the sky from 8,500 feet above London. We can see some of this damage plain as day on the other side of St. Bart's Hospital. Most people assume this is Blitz bomb damage, but my tour guests are surprised to find out that it actually dates to World War I. As the airship glided silently through the sky, it passed 44 Red Lion Street in Bloomsbury and at 1040 dropped a high explosive down on the Dolphin Tavern, an old boozer. The pub, dating originally to 1805, was razed to the ground and three customers were killed. However, when the owners began combing through the rubble, they discovered that their bar clock was almost untouched, except the hands were frozen at exactly 10.40 p.m. when the bomb had landed. After the pub was rebuilt after the war, the clock was reinstalled and given pride of place, as you can see, a reminder of the horror and destruction that rained down on London in World War I. This quaint little locals pub is stuck in time in more ways than one, and it's well worth a visit. It's just a short walk from the British Museum. Here we are in Wapping at the Prospect of Whitby, which claims to be the oldest riverside tavern dating from around 1520. And this is the infamous noose hanging on the banks of the River Thames. When the river's tide is low, you can find many folks here mudlarking, that is, searching the shore for treasures from the past churned up by the artificially narrowed river. And here, they're hoping for especially dark trinkets. Now, this is a topic that could definitely use its own video. So let me know if you're interested in a video just on the history of public executions as told through the artifacts in London's museums and churches. Apocryphally, this is where sailors, smugglers, cutthroats, and footpads met to plan their voyages. And isn't footpad a delightful term? It means a criminal who mugs pedestrians. Footpad sounds better. Patrons included Sir Hugh Willoughby. He is believed to have sailed from here in 1553 in a legendarily failed attempt to discover the Northeast Passage to China. We can also see the pub's 18th century pewter-topped bar, which is ultra-rare in modern England. These are much more common to see in Paris. Famously, both Whistler and J.M.W. Turner, a favorite of mine, sketched the Thames from this very window. And to see more about Turner and what he witnessed from the banks of the Thames, watch my tour of the National Gallery linked above. Back in the 17th century, this pub became the regular haunt of the legendary hanging judge, Jeffreys, known for his hard line against those involved in the Monmouth Rebellion. That is, the attempt by the Protestant James Scott, first Duke of Monmouth, the illegitimate son of King Charles II, and as he tried to take the crown from his not-so-secretly Catholic uncle, King James II. After the failed rebellion of 1685, Judge Jeffreys was sent to the West Country, along with four other judges, to conduct the rebels' trials, which are collectively known as the Bloody Assizes. Now, of course, this name makes it sound like the trials were, well, bloody, and they did result in capital punishment, make no mistake. But while some people claim the number of rebels executed for treason was as high as 700, the more likely figure is around 170 out of 1,381 defendants who were found guilty of treason. So while history often regards Jeffries as vindictive and harsh, his judicial record shows that he was actually rather lenient, but his legend looms large here in Wapping. Jeffreys lived nearby and patronized this pub, walking on these very flagstones. And so this replica gallows a noose outside is in his honor, I guess. It's kind of an unnerving thing to see while you're sipping on a pint. 
But the prospect of Whitby isn't the only pub associated with Judge Jeffries, nor with the history of executions here on this shady stretch of the Thames. We also need to visit the town of Ramsgate. After all, the 17th century was rife with rebellion, fire, plague, and pirates, and we are down by the docks and the figurative wrong side of the tracks where chaos and depravity reigned supreme. Legend says that crowds would gather at the execution dock, which was actually a scaffold, to watch pirates, smugglers, and mutineers be hanged by a short rope. Remember, it takes longer that way. (laughs) The exact site of the execution dock is up for debate, but some say it was here at the Whopping Old Stairs, just next to the town of Ramsgate Pub. This is the most likely location of the execution dock. After the Glorious Revolution in 1688, which saw James II overthrown by his daughter Mary II and her husband William III, the Protestant Catholic and Royalist anti-Royalist divisions were deeper than ever. As the noose indicates, no one had forgotten Geoffrey's role in the bloody assizes, and he was famously chased by an angry mob into this pub just down the street, the town of Ramsgate. He may have even been disguised as a sailor, planning to slip away to Germany. Jeffries was soon imprisoned at the tower, some say for his own safety, and he died soon after, but ironically not at the hands of the crowd, but due to the drink, some of which he probably got here. But back to the prospect of Whitby. Whether you want to raise a glass to Jeffries or curse him one last time, this is a really nice pub. It's incredibly atmospheric right here on the banks of the river, especially at high tide, decorated with nautical bits and bobs and perfect for an afternoon tipple. That is, if you don't mind catching the sight of a noose kind of dangling in the wind out of the corner of your eye. If you want to go right down onto the river shore, make sure you check the tides because the Thames is a tidal river. Now, before we leave Wapping, we have to mention one more pub connected to the execution dock. Infamous pirate Captain William Kidd was executed here in 1701 at the execution dock. He was originally a privateer who traveled far and wide to stop piracy and protect English interests at sea. However, when he traveled to Madagascar, he befriended the pirates there and saw the allure of their ways, and he took up piracy himself and was eventually caught. This pub, the Captain Kidd, commemorates his life and his death here in Wapping. Now, we're staying in the east, but let's head a little further north, over to Bromley by Bow, to the Widow's Son. It's a grade two listed pub built in the early 19th century. Some say this was the site of an old widow's cottage, hence the name. However, no one really calls it the Widow's Son. Instead, locals always refer to it as the Bun House, for one specifically strange reason. Every year on Good Friday, that's the Friday before Easter, the pub hoists a net of hot cross buns from the ceiling up over the bar. Now, for my viewers who are unfamiliar, hot cross buns are a Good Friday treat associated with the entire Easter period. They're a spiced bun, often dotted with dried fruit and marked with a cross. My English husband loves them, but I don't really care for them. Now, this is all lore, but perhaps there is some truth to the story. You can decide. Legend says that the widow, the one of the cottage, had a son, and when he left to go to sea, maybe during the Napoleonic Wars, he wrote her a letter and said he would be home by Easter, so she should have some hot cross buns ready for him. Tragically, he never returned, but she continued to prepare fresh hot cross buns for him every year. The story goes that when her cottage was demolished to build this pub, the builders found a net of each year's untouched buns hanging from her ceiling. And ever since then, the Royal Navy has continued this tradition, and they add a new bun to the net in her honor for hundreds of years. The bun is baked by, are you ready? Mr. Bun of Bun's Bakery in Romford. How perfect. But while this is probably just a myth, there have long been many stories associated with hot cross buns, with many considering them to have strange and special properties. Many people believe that hot cross buns can never go stale. Trust me, they don't get a chance in my house. Um, But perhaps this is entwined with the resurrection and eternal life. Now, a fire in the Widow's Son pub in the 1980s burnt many of the old buns in the net, but their burnt remnants are still included in the net as a memento. 
When the pub was previously closed in 2016, the ceremony took place at the Queen's Head in Limehouse, with none other than Sir Ian McKellen in attendance. He owns a pub nearby called The Grapes, and he played the Ballad of the Widow's Son, and Mr. Bun's hot cross buns were distributed to all. Sadly, The Widow's Son is currently closed. It looks like it didn't survive the pandemic, but it is right on the edge of a bustling housing estate and new condo developments, so hopefully it's only a matter of time before it reopens. And when it does, I'm sure the new owners will carry on this bizarre and wonderful tradition. Weirdly enough, this isn't the only English pub with the tradition of nailing buns to the ceiling. (laughs) Nope, it also happens at the Bell Inn at Horndon on the Hill in Essex. You can also go and gaze at their ossified buns. Their tradition has a slightly different origin, though. When landlord Jack Turnell took over the inn on Good Friday around 1900, he hung a bun from the beam to commemorate the day. Ever since then, the pub has done the same, even using a concrete bun at the height of food rationing during the Second World War. Now, do we have time for an honorable mention? I think we do. Here's a bonus at the Tower of London. The Yeoman Warders, more commonly known as the Bee Feeders, have their own private pub located within the walls of the fortress. It's open to the warders as well as to the other staff who live at the tower and their families and guests. The pub is called the Keys, named for the ceremony of the Keys, of course, but often just called the Yeoman Warders Club. And while I have friends and fellow guides who've actually lived in the tower walls and imbibed at the Keys, I don't have any footage of the macabre object that deserves to be listed on this tour. On one of the walls of this most exclusive pubs hangs an executioner's axe and a sign that used to mark the site of the executioner's scaffold. And of course, this being the tower, the axe was likely used at some point, though there's no record of whose head it may have lopped off. Note that this isn't the axe and block that are on display in the nearby armory, which is worth a look the next time you're at the tower. Now, while the Keys is usually ultra private, there is one weekend a year you might have luck getting your hands on a pint of the locally brewed Yeoman 1485 or Beefeater Bitter Beers. It is often open during London Open House every September, during which public access is granted to many normally off-limit spaces and a chance for you to experience this macabre object. Now, for the others on our tour, they're open all year round to the public. Well, from the vaults underneath the old Cheshire cheese, that's the end of our video. I hope that you enjoyed this exploration of the truly bizarre things that are kept in some of London's pubs. And let me know if you've been here or if you're planning to go. I'll see you the next time I'm in the pub or the museum.